A Court of Thorns and Roses, a wildly biased summary. Farah is a 19-year-old girl who is poor and starving and freezing in ancient fantasy land. Farah's out hunting one day and finds a lovely deer and she goes, oh boy, yummy yummy, but uh-oh, there's a big old wolf there hunting it too. And Farah's like, that wolf is entirely too big. There's a 110% chance that it is a fairy, which means if I try to kill it, I may open up a can of worms threatening not only me and my family, but also possibly my mortal soul, as all of magic is a strange wonder that goes far beyond my comprehension. I only know that there's innumerable horrors and atrocities fairy kind has done to my people and legends told long before me. <laughs> but if I don't kill it, I'll be hungies. And then she kills the wolf and brings the pelt and the deer home to her ungrateful family in their shabby cottage. Apparently her family used to be particularly wealthy, but her dad lost their fortune with a bad deal having to do with some ships across the sea and some mafioso-like investors. Once they busted daddy's kneecaps and took the house, it was up to Feyre, the youngest, to pick up survival skills because, as it is described in the book, her older sisters, Nesta and Elaine, were simply too accustomed to wealthy life that they couldn't adapt to being poor. Nesta is an absolute bitch about it, letting life-sustaining chores go undone because she's simply not meant for that kind of work. And Elaine is just that one girl from Mean Girls who says mean shit, but there's not actually a mean bone in her body. Barely a thought behind those eyes, really. Does not even recognize that they are poor and in a shack. A lack of common sense and self-preservation runs deep in the family. It's a miracle Farah picked up a bow. All right, I'm not gonna lie, I blacked out a little bit in this part, but oh god, okay, a lion busts into the cottage and is like, you killed my wolf friend. By the rules of the fairies, I can either end you right here and now, or you agree to come with me to my fairy castle, never to return. And she's like, and what, like, be trapped in servitude forever? And he's like, nah, just like, be there. What? To which her family says, bye, bitch! So she goes to Fairyland, which is called Prithian, and Blind Man has a big, pretty estate, and he turns into a big, pretty man named Tamlin, who hates violence, but is also a product of war, but is also really caring, but also has a heart of stone. And we get to meet his right-hand man, Lucian, who is the best. We love him. He's sassy and funny and a little bit of a prick, and probably the most sane being in the tri-state area. The next three quarters of the book are so brain-numbing, but in summary, Feyre lives in the castle, and over the course of a few months, Stockholm Syndrome falls in love with Tim Tam. My girl Lucian is right there, but whatever. We learn that Timothy and Lucian are high fae, which means they're better than other fairies. There are seven courts in Fairyland that rule. They are broken up by the seasons, but also by the time of day for some reason. Tommy Bahama happens to be the High Lord of the Spring Court, which means he's essentially the god of spring. They have this one ritual where he kind of becomes the avatar of all the magic of spring, so Feyre is warned to stay away from the absolute rager they'll be hosting outside, as it is potentially dangerous for humans. Unable to follow a single goddamn instruction, she does a quick peek rooney of the festivities, resulting in her getting immediately accosted by evil fairies. Which I will say, that is the formula you missed in the entire fun and game section of the book that we are skipping over. Every day, she defies warnings or does not follow directions and then is accosted by evil fairies and needs to be rescued. This girl cannot learn. But she's saved by tall, dark, and handsome, who gives her a wink and leaves. He'll be important later. And then Lucian finds her and takes her back home. He warns again, hey, stay away from the party. Timmy Turner is going to get coked up on spring magic, which will make him violently horny. And Feyre's like, ooh. And Lucian's like, emphasis on violent. And Feyre's like, ah. Feyre mostly stays in her room, but eventually sneaks out in the middle of the night once she thinks it's over with. To which Trampoline finds her, bites her neck, dry humps her for 15 seconds, and then flees. Why she likes this man, I do not know. But anyways, back to the lore. There's been a blight affecting everybody, humans and fairies. And that's why there's a bunch of shitty fairies causing a ruckus where they're not supposed to be because there's evil in the air and they're excited about it. This blight can be attributed to one sadistic girl boss named Amarantha who hates humans and pulled some wild shit a hundred years ago during some war having to do with both fairies and humans. I kind of blanked out on that bit. But essentially, she somehow managed to get an iron grip over all the high lords and has sent fairyland out of whack. After ascending to power, she tried to woo Tom a truck, the hottest of the High Lords, and was rejected, to which Amarantha cursed him and his whole court to wear pretty masks and reduce their power by a lot, apparently. Uh, which still leaves them particularly powerful in my opinion. More on that later. 
Amarantha sends in Tall, Dark, and Handsome to Channing Tatum's house in a power play sort of threatening thing. Uh, we find out his name is Resand, and he is the High Lord of the Night Court. And he lays out a few wordy jabs at Trisket to make him nervous, and then he also asks for Feyre's name, to which her one brain cell finally fires off, and she does the smartest thing ever, and gives him the name of her old neighbor Clara instead of her own. And he's like, okay, and leaves. Wink, wink. The whole interaction makes Trampoline nervous, and he's like, hey, Farrah, you should go home now. It is getting way too dangerous here for you. And she's like, what? But I thought I was your prisoner here. Like, the life debt thing? I killed one of your best friends? And he's like, don't worry about that. Just go home. And she's like, can I have one sex before I go? He's like, okay, you can have one sex before you go. And then they have one and a half sex, and then he kicks her out first thing in the morning. We're about to get to the good part of the book, which has the least amount of Tammy Lynn and the most amount of suffering for Farrah, which I don't know what that says about me, with this being my favorite part of the book, but it's a fun ride from here. So they send Farrah off, and Thomas the Tank Engine is like, hey, I love you, by the way, to which Farrah gives him a crisp thumbs up and leaves. <laughs> Farrah comes home not to her dying family in the cabin in the woods, but to a grand estate. Apparently, Terracotta glamoured the shit out of Farrah's family and pretty much everyone who has ever interacted with them. Farrah's family does not remember anything having to do with the fairies and is convinced she was sent off to go help with their dying aunt that doesn't exist, so they have been 0% worried about her. Her dad is healed miraculously, somehow the missing ships return, and the family is back in business, jettisoned into a life of fortune. Everyone is happy and normal and thinking everything is hunky-dory, except for Nesta, who pulls Pharaoh aside and says, I remember everything. Which, just to put into perspective, once again, Temper Pedic and his court used magic to completely alter reality around this family, conjuring money and fortune and whisking memories away from their mortal minds, seamlessly replacing them. Throughout this book, Feyre sees that even the weakest members of the Fae are wildly powerful and constantly fucking around with the senses. The Fae essentially invented manipulation. And while there, it's almost impossible at any given point in time to know what you can trust, not even yourself in your own mind. So Tammy Lee Jones comes in with all this power that manipulates all these mortals, and Ness is like, mm -mm, you can't tell me how to think. No magic. She literally is just so innately stubborn that she defied the magic of a god with just her pure audacity. I love her. I love Nesta. What an amazing character. I want to see more of her in the series. Ferris spills the beans to Nesta, so she's in on the skippy. Uh, and they had more of a rocky relationship before, but after this, they bond, and they're finally on track to having a good, healthy, sisterly relationship. Love that for them. One night at dinner, it's mentioned, hey, remember that neighbor Clara we had? Just last week, her family's house mysteriously burned down and they never found the bodies. Weird, huh? And Ferris stands up at the table and is like, wow, that's weird. I have to go. Hey, Nesta, you might want to amp up security here immediately, if not sooner. And she's like, what? Why? She's like, because I was supposed to be me. Fay? Fay, say less. Fair comes back to the Supreme Court and it's all empty except for Alice the Handmaiden, who lists off the full terms and conditions of the curse, and how because Tamanda Bynes didn't meet the conditions before a certain date, he's trapped under the mountain under Amarantha's rule. And Alice is like, and you know what would have prevented all of this? She's like, what? She's like, if you said I love you back. Shit. Yeah, weirdly, Amarantha required that he needed to find love in a human girl who was also a fey killer, among a thousand other requirements, and Feyre happened to perfectly fit the bill. Wow, what are the odds? So Feyre's like, well, I'm gonna go under the mountain and make things right, to which Alice says, you definitely shouldn't. You'll probably immediately die or suffer eternally. But if I know anything about you after all these months of being on the Keep Feyre Alive task force, there is nothing in this world that can stop you from hurtling your body towards the most dangerous thing immediately present to you. So since you're going, just follow these three simple rules in order to survive. Do not give your real name, do not make a deal with a fairy, and do not drink the wine. Farah goes under the mountain, proceeds to immediately give Amarantha her full government name, makes a deal with not one, but two fairies, and then goes on a three-month bender off of fairy wine. <laughs> So in order to save the love of her life and rescue pretty much the entire governing body of fairies, Feyre makes a deal with Amarantha for their freedom. But Amarantha makes her go through all these weird trials, including but not limited to kill a worm, household chores, dancing under the influence, and reading. Which I haven't mentioned up to this point, but Feyre is painfully illiterate. And the fact that one of the final trials is just reading is hilarious to me. Once she completes all the tasks, they'll be free. But if she solves a riddle, she doesn't have to do any of the trials. It's all immediately over with. Being a dumbass, she cannot solve the riddle, so she ends up going through all the death trials. 
Because Feyre is mortal and incompetent, she makes a deal with Rysanne to heal her up so that she can carry on with the rest of the trials, in exchange for spending some quality time with him if she lives after all this. And he also ends up bending over backwards at every turn to make sure she stays alive by working from the sidelines. But he does that bit for free. Wink, wink. She also gets a lot of help from Lucian, but his help is less subtle, and so he keeps getting violently punished for it. But he continues helping anyways, because he's the best. You know who doesn't help? Tampon, who is just sitting there in the throne room watching it all happen because he's like, I can't do it. Oh, Amarantha is watching me. I can't do anything. She's watching me. That's a suck. Meanwhile, these Fae who are supposedly less powerful than Timbaland Boots are doing everything under the sun to keep this little human alive. What a guy! <laughs> the last thing Amarantha asks for Feyre to do is stab three fairies in the heart, which is as traumatizing as you'd think for a 19-year-old girl to do. And, oh no, one of the three fairies is her boyfriend, Toyota Corolla. Oh no! But Feyre calls Amarantha's bluff, stabs her boo's heart, and it turns out he literally has a heart of stone, so he doesn't die. Which, the payoff for that moment, was kind of lost on me, but whatever. Amarantha is like, well, I didn't say you could go immediately, not unless you solved the riddle, which it didn't. So she proceeds to break every single bone in Feyre's body. Tylenol is useless, Reese tries to help, it's actually really fucking romantic, wink. Wink! And in her dying breaths, Feyre's one singular brain cell fires off a final time in desperation, and she solves the riddle. The answer is, is love, isn't it? No sh- The curse is lifted and Trico tears that bitch apart. Feyre fully dies, but all the seven High Lords are like, that was really cool what she did for us. We should make her a high fae. And with their powers combined, they bring her back to life with pointier ears. So Feyre gets to go home to the spring court with testosterone and everything is totally fine. Haha, <laughs> not. She still made that deal with tall, dark, and handsome. And it's implied we're going to be seeing more of him soon. Wink, 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 wink. That's the book.